Hey guys, what's up? Massey Baseball, Dr. Medic, whatever you want to call me, I am back. It has been nine years. Nine years since I uploaded my first video. That's about half my life. I created this channel on April 26, 2014 and uploaded my first video, once I figured out how, on January 10th, 2015. I have been planning this video. On my eighth anniversary, last year, I did a ranking video. In that video, I ranked each weapon and gave a fun fact. Unfortunately, I never actually completed the video. I got sidetracked with school. I was finishing up my senior year of high school. I played sports, specifically baseball. I actually have a whole nother channel if you like to, you know, check that out. Little plug here. I'll link that in the description. But like I said, I never actually completed the video. This time will be different. I started this project on November 25th, 2023. I'm finished with finals. I do have a few sports related events I have to attend, but I will try my best to get this video out by January of 2024. So check the description and tell me if I actually, you know, got it out. But that all that being said, let's get to the video. There is no particular order to this ranking. I'm not going from best to worst or oldest to newest. I'm simply going by the order it was in the old tier list video, which is posted if you'd like to see it for whatever reason. Basically, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm obviously going to give the weapon the name. I will announce when the weapon was added, its rank, A, B, C, D, F, and beyond. Okay, guys, so this was uh, recorded after making the original. I decided to change how I'm going to kind of explain the ranking because I, w I recorded a couple videos and I realized it sounded really weird. So instead of doing the A, B, C, D, F, and beyond F scale, I'm simply going to start at S. So it's going to go S, A, B, C, D, F. Just because that's what most tier lists do, and I think it will just overall be better. So kind of disregard what I say about the, uh, about the grading system. Sorry about that. Let's get back to the video. Beyond F, I will give why I put it in this tier, and I will give a fun fact about it, which is why most of you are here anyway, I assume. Just a heads up, the first part of the video will be identical to the old one, but anyway, let's begin. Starting off with the extinguisher. The extinguisher was added on June 19, 2008. It's a fall from grace, but then was resurrected, not enough to make it very viable. However, in the Jungle Inferno update, it was given a complete revamp, and it was made actually pretty good. In the original tier list video, I put it in the F tier, or the bad tier, however, I believe it actually deserves the D tier, as it's not terrible, but not great any. Fun fact. As a tribute to Skejic, a very good pyromane back in the day who died of a terrible illness, Valve added his name to the extinguisher around the Jungle Inferno update of 2017. Though, when it was found out that he lied about having this illness, his name and tribute was revoked. The Ambassador added May 21st, 2009. From a terrible snai weapon, to just all right, to do we have the ambassador? That's what I wrote in the original video, I, whatever that means. Anyway, in the original video, I put this in the C tier because it's pretty average, you know, it's good. But ever since the nerf in the Jumbo Inferno update, it hasn't been the same. Uh oh, but this, this one actually has a very interesting piece of trivia and a lot of people don't know this. So, unless you were obviously around at the time. On release, this weapon had no fall off, but it only mini crit on headshot. And this was with the damage penalty in general, so it did barely any extra damage. This was the update that added mini crits to begin with, so it kind of made sense. You know, the Jurati got the ability to mini crit, the Ambassador got the ability to mini crit, but they realized, man, this weapon kind of sucks. Not too long afterwards, it was changed to critting on headshot. And then obviously in the Jungle Inferno update, they made it actually have fall off, which made the weapon fall off, right? Big Earner, added June 23rd, 2012. While great spy players may be able to use this weapon to chain stab practically the entire team, for the average player, this weapon is just a knife with a 25 health penalty. So if you're like me and you're just kind of whatever at spy, this weapon's not gonna be very good. Though, if you are a spy main, you may be able to get a lot more use out of this, and you might rank this a lot higher. Um, it's nice for the slight speed boost, but other than that, for the most part, this weapon is just kind of okay, so I put this in the C tier. It is a very high C, probably the highest 
C out of all of the C tier, but Thorpe is just kind of whatever. Though for a little piece of trivia, on release the big earner did not have the 3 second speed boost, only granting you some cloak back on a successful kill. This means this weapon was usually placed in the bin before the stat was added. If any of you played during that time, yeah, this 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 was not very good. It gave you about 30% cloak back, which you got even more from just the weapon dropping on the ground. So this weapon was complete garbage before the 3 second speed boost was added. Alright, a pretty uninteresting weapon is the Stock Bat. It was added on October 10th, 2007, you know, with the release of the game. It's pretty underwhelming. With all the alternatives, with one or two exceptions being leagues above this weapon. This weapon is just, it's not good, you know. Nobody runs the Stock Bat. And if they are running the Stock Bat, it's, you know, uh, the Holy Mackerel, you know, the Bat Saber. A strange bad saver or whatever nobody runs the stock bad unless they're brand new in the original i put this in the d tier and i believe that's exactly where it's gonna stay it's it's uninteresting it's not very good there's so many better options the atomizer the well maybe not the sandman anymore but once upon a time right all of these weapons they're, ju they're just so much better there's not much trivia on the bat because you know it doesn't get change of stats but the bat did receive new swing animations in 2008, so there's that. The base jumper, added June 18th, 2014. Great for trollers, but prior to the Jungle Inferno, this thing was hated by the competitive players due to the constant deploy and undeploy mechanic it had prior. I also didn't have this in the original video, but um, you're gonna get two pieces of trivia with this one. I ranked it in the C tier, which is probably about where it should be. If this was pre-Jungle Inferno, I probably would have put it in the high B tier. Anyway, two pieces of trivia. First, before it was patched, originally if you were lit on fire by the Cow Mangler, this is simply off the top of my head, that's how well I remember this, you would be able to basically float. You would never actually descend, which is pretty interesting. And another piece of trivia, this item cannot be equipped alongside backpack cosmetics due to occupying the same spot. I, I know this is pretty obvious, but for some newer players that have never tried it, yeah, you actually cannot equip the base jumper if you have a backpack item. The more you know. The Battalion's Backup, added September 30th, 2010. There's nothing really much to say about it, it's simply just a good banner, it's kind of the halfway point between the banners. It's especially good for pushes in the sentry heavy areas when you got a lot of turtling NGs on the other team. But apart from that, it's just kind of a basic banner. In the original video, I put this in the B tier, and I believe that's where I'm going to leave it. It's good. It's definitely good. But there are better options, you know. The conch, the, oh, the righteous bison, one of the best weapons in the game, period. Yeah, joking about that, by the way. Anyway... Trivia. Now this is actually pretty interesting. Upon release, it did not have the plus 20 HP on wear stat, which is one reason that people use the Battalion as a backup, is because it just gives you a flat health bonus. It originally did not have the stat, and it also did not offer as much resistance against sentries. Additionally, it used to charge by taking damage rather than dealing damage. If you didn't know, the original banners used to work differently. Buff banner by dealing damage. The battalion's backup was charged by receiving damage, and the conch was charged by receiving and dealing damage. Though this was all changed back in around 2012-2013, so it's no longer this way. Next on the list, we have the Babyface's Blaster, added June 27th, 2012. Upon release, it sucked, then it was kind of overpowered. Now it's arguably worse than it was on launch. This, unlike the Extinguisher, was not a fall from grace, but rather a rise to fame, then the fame kind of go into its head, and him ending back in the gutter again. In the original video, I put this in the F tier, and I believe that's exactly where it's going to stay. This weapon kind of sucks. I mean, come on. 25 damage to completely remove your boost is pretty ridiculous. Now for a piece of trivia, before the added 34% clip size penalty, it was the only scatter gun to hold 6 besides stock. Once that was changed, every single 
unlockable primary for Scout has Eclipse Eyes penalty. Go ahead, try to think of one that doesn't, besides stock. Bizarre Bargain was added June 23rd, 2011. The sniper is great for those who actually know how to play sniper. It can absolutely decimate teams with the fast recharge. Though, personally, I suck at sniper. I respect it, but I'm personally not a fan of it. In the original, I put this in the A tier, though it, it's a very high A tier. You know, if you know how to use it, it could be even a low S tier weapon. Because of just how fast it charges. Or if you're a cheater, you know, either one. But a little piece of trivia that's actually pretty interesting about this weapon. This weapon used to add heads on a headshot rather than headshot kill. So you didn't actually need to kill the person in order to get the heads for it. But all heads used to be cleared if you missed a headshot. Yeah, so if you missed... All your heads would be drained. So if you had eight heads and you missed, sorry, you have you have to completely start over. This was changed later in 2011. The black box added September 30th, 2010. The conch, black box, and escape plan combo can't be beat. This weapon is very good and it's hard to deny it. It is a simple plus 20 health on shot, one rocket in the tube. Overall, this weapon is quite good. So obviously I wrote that incorrectly. Um, you have three rockets in the tube. You are missing one. So in the original video, I put this in the B tier. And that's pretty much where it's going to stay. Little piece of trivia. This weapon used to always give you plus 15 HP, regardless of fall off. And it would stack with multiple players. Though this was changed in the Gun Metal update to be 20 without the ability to stack. Basically what this means is that... If you just did some damage to a player, it gave you 15 health. And if you did that to a bunch of players, it gave you plus 15 health for each of them. However, this was changed, like I said, in the gunmetal update, so now you only get up to plus 20 HP. So you can shoot into a crowd, the most you can get is 20. But it now has fall off, which means you can get less than 20. Next, we have the Backscatter, added June 18th, 2014. This weapon is just really not that good. The accuracy penalty kills this weapon, to be honest. It's not bad on paper, in concept, but it was just a really bad execution. I have never seen somebody unironically run this. Typically, when anybody runs the Backscatter, it's just kind of like, huh, can I get it to work? There's just so many better options. The stock, of course. The short stop. Hell, even the, even the force of nature. And of course, the Soda Popper are all better weapons than the Backscatter is. The Backscatter is kind of irrelevant. Um, and actually, recording the first time I recorded this, I forgot to rank it. That's how, that's how uh, irrelevant it is. Anyway, in the original video, I put this in the D tier, and I believe that's exactly where it belongs. It isn't as bad as the Babyface Blaster. I would much rather use the Backscatter over that, but it's still pretty trash. And to just show how irrelevant this weapon is, I couldn't really find anything all that interesting on the Backscatter, so I took this straight from the wiki. Trivia. The saddle magazine featured on the Backscatter is based on a World War II era, whatever this is, magazine. I'll throw up a picture too, just so you can kind of compare the two. Next is the Back Scratcher, added December 17th, 2010. While overshadowed by the power jack, this melee is a great tool for survivability. Rather than running away, you pick up a health pack and get extra from it. It's amazing. From a medium health pack, you go from picking up, I believe it's about 80, 78, 80. Pair it with the back scratcher, you get 132 HP from medium sized health packs. Now, I know the power jack is kind of objectively better, but personally, this is the weapon I run more often. I rank this as a B tier weapon in my original ranking, and I believe that's about where it's gonna say, maybe a B plus, you know, kind of the high end of B. Backburner, at a June 19th, 2008 in the original Pyro update. A very average weapon, it has its moments to shine, but it's nothing special. Kind of like a better version of the Backscatter. In the original ranking, I put this in the B tier, and I believe that's about where it's going to stay. Once again, it's another high level B tier. It's actually not a bad weapon, and it's hard to have a bad weapon when, you know, it doesn't really do much different from stock. So take that as you will. But this weapon actually does have an interesting piece of trivia. On release, these were the stats. Crits from behind, 
plus 50 HP on wearer, no air blast. That is the original set of stats. And the funniest part about this is air blast was added in this update. So they simply added a weapon to take that away. And on top of that, you had 225 health pyros running around that could crit from behind. So it was a, it was an interesting time. This was this was changed later on, obviously. The Blute Sugger, the Blood Sugger, whatever you want to call it, added April 29th, 2008, in the original Gold Rush update, the Medic update. The perfect battle medic weapon, though the crossbow is just insanely good. So this weapon is often outclassed. It's really worth using. And that kind of goes for all syringes, uh, syringe-based weapons, to be honest. Overall, it's just kind of average. It's nothing too special. I put this in the C tier uh, in the original video, so that's exactly where it's going to stay. Though, an interesting piece of trivia, upon release, its only downside was no random crits. Pretty balanced, right? You'd be surprised. This was actually a very common practice for Valve back in the day, with the only downside being that it couldn't crit. The Baker's Bazooka, added June 27th, 2012. If used correctly, it's great, especially for rocket jumping via overloading. And also, I know I'm not taking this into consideration, but it is also a great MVM choice. Though, it's really nothing amazing. So, I'm going to put this weapon in the C tier. So, it's, it's a pretty average. I mean, it's not bad, but it's not great. A little piece of trivia. Overloaded rockets used to take from the reserve rather than the clip, meaning you could chain a bunch of rockets together. So currently it takes it from the actual clip of the weapon. It's not, not really a magazine, you know, the actual, I don't know what you want to call it, from the chamber, I guess, which means you can only chain three rockets together before you have to reload. However, originally it would explode and you would continuously put new rounds in, new rockets in, and it would take from the reserve, which means you could chain four, five, six, seven, eight rockets together. Though this was patched. The Atomizer, released June 23rd, 2011. This weapon's good, there's not much to say. It's a great option for mobility and doing what the scout does best, pestering people. In the original video, I put this in the B tier, and that is where it is going to stay for this video as well. Trivia. There isn't much interesting information about the atomizer, but if you didn't know, on release, this weapon would subtract 10 health on jump, but it did not need to be deployed to do so. It could be equipped and completely forgotten about. Bonk Atomic Punch, released February 24th, 2009. This weapon is niche. It can be great for getting past entry ass, but ever since the Jungle Inferno update where they added the slowdown, it just has not been the same. This weapon right here is a solid C-tier weapon. Now a little piece of trivia, and it kind of ties back into what I was saying about it. So, like I stated, the Jungle Inferno update added a slowdown effect, and obviously it scales with the amount of damage that you take. So the less damage you take, the less slowdown effect you have. However, many might not know this, the slowdown effect isn't actually new. When the item originally released, it did reduce your movement speed by about half, regardless of the damage you take. It. So you could take no damage, or you could take 100 damage, 1000 damage, it doesn't really matter. It would slow you down anyway. This stat was removed in April of 2010. The Airstrike, added June 18th, 2014. This is a weapon that you kind of just equip when you want to mess around a little bit. It's a solid option for man versus machine, though the beggars outperforms it there as well. The Airstrike is the weapon that you equip when you feel like shaking up the black box conch escape ham combo that you've been running for the last 5 to 10 years. Anyway, sorry to call you out, this weapon is a C tier weapon. A little bit of trivia. When this weapon first launched, it actually did have a clip size penalty, only holding 3 rockets rather than 4. The Boston Basher, added December 17, 2010. It's alright, forgettable. You're better off running the Candy Cane Fan of War or the Godsend Holy Mackerel. There's really no point of using this weapon unless you just want to mess around. It's a C tier weapon. Trivia. There really isn't anything interesting about this weapon, at least nothing I could find. Though, just so there's something, unlike other weapons with blood, the Boston Basher is not censored in countries like Germany that normally would censor blood. 
stock bottle added October 10th, 2007. It's a stock melee. There's very little reason to run this over Devilman's swords, but if you want something reliable, it is an option. C tier. Trivia. As some may know, the bottle got the ability to break in the Jungle Inferno update of 2017. However, this was originally a feature to begin with. On the game's release back in 2007, a decade prior, the bottle did break, though at some point this bugged out and prevented the bottle from breaking. The Buff Banner, added December 17th, 2009. Gotta love the Buff Banner. The only banner without a passive ability, but it makes up for it as it is really good for pushes. And it also is a go-to for man versus machine players. You can't go wrong with it. B tier. Little bit of trivia. Originally, this was the only banner that charged by damage and damage alone. If you remember from earlier in the video, like I said, the battalion's backup charged by taking damage, and the conch charged by taking and dealing damage. The buff banner was the only one that charged by dealing damage. In addition to this, it originally took a lot longer to charge up, about 40% longer, however, it also lasted 14 seconds rather than 10. The Bushwaka, released September 30th, 2010 in the Man Economy Update. A great choice for Sniper, good man versus machine for tank busting alongside the Cleaner's Carbine, as well as being paired with the Jurati and Casual. It's also great at deterring spies. B tier. Trivia. Uh, there's not really much interesting trivia about the Bushwaka as it hasn't gone through many changes, though on release it had the downside of a 20% fire vulnerability on wear. But this was changed in 2015 to a flat 20% damage vulnerability, but only while active. Brass Bees, released December 17th, 2010. Amazing for man versus machine. The number one go-to is it offers a direct damage bonus which cannot be found in the upgrades. Though, in casual, this minigun is pretty hard to use, with the slow spin-up and the movement speed penalty while spun up. It leaves you extremely vulnerable. Not ideal. D tier. Trivia, this weapon didn't originally release with the 20% damage resistance when spun up below 50% health, which made it even more of a risk to use. Actually, in the Gunmetal update of 2015, when this attribute was added in the first place, and it was both added to the Brass Beast and Natasha, it gave you a 20% damage resistance when spun up regardless of HP. The Buffalo Steak Sandwich released December 17, 2010 alongside the Brass Beast. This weapon is actually kind of fun to mess around with, which is kind of what you're supposed to do in TF2 anyway, though it's not practical and it's a joke of a secondary weapon. D tier. Trivia. Like other lunchbox items, the buffalo steak could not be thrown down for teammates. The buffalo steak also made you take mini crits before this was eventually changed to 25% damage taken, which was also not true because the real number was actually 10%. This was fixed in Meet Your Match, so it actually, you know, made you take 25% more damage. And then finally in the Jungle Inferno update, the duration of the stake was increased from 15 seconds to 16 whole seconds. I know, big change there. And the damage vulnerability was reduced from 25% to 20%. The Candy Cane, released December 17th, 2010. It's a viable scout melee. The weapon doesn't need to be deployed to drop med kits for you or your team. But watch out for Soldier and Devilman. There are better options, but this one is not bad if you want a simple plus minus stat weapon. B tier. Trivia. There's nothing really interesting on the Candy Cane, as it hasn't gone through any stat changes. The only thing of interest that I could find is that it didn't have a distinct kill icon, instead using the stock bat icon. The Charge and Targe, released December 17th, 2009 in the War Update. This is the most vanilla shell there is. You can't go wrong, great for hybrid knight due to its much higher resistances than the other shields, but the other shields offer more for demo knight himself. Though this weapon is still A tier. Trivia. On release, the charger charge had team colored stripes rather than the yellow ones it has now. It also offered a 65% resistance to explosives, which meant that a pill would only do 35 damage. Kind of insane. The Clayton Moore, added December 17th, 2010. 
On release, the sword was not too bad, being a good side grade to the Islander. However, in the tough break update, this weapon became a joke, with some of the worst stats I've probably ever seen. Some could argue it was a master of all trades, but this is a lie. It wasn't a master of anything. However, it was reverted, almost, in the Jungle Inferno update. On release, it originally had a negative 15 HP on wear, which made it so that you would have 160 HP, but it had the extra 0.5 seconds charge. Then it was neutered, though when it was reverted in quotations, they didn't reinstill the health penalty, they instead kept the negative 15% damage vulnerability. This isn't bad for Hybrid Knight, but for Demo Knight, the negative 15% damage vulnerability effectively gives them 149 HP. Well, even with this in the current state, it's not that bad of a weapon. B tier. Trivia. These are the stats that the Clade Moore had between the Tough Break update and the Jungle Inferno update. Plus 25 HP on kill. Melee refills 25% of your charge meter with the downside of a 15% damage vulnerability on wear and no random critical hits. Yeah, that kind of sucks. The classic added June 18th, 2014. Let's cut straight to the chase. This weapon was a joke. It's close to being an interesting side grade, but falls short due to the fact that it can't headshot until it's fully charged. And the 10% damage penalty on body shots is just lemon in the wound. D tier. Trivia, there's not much really interesting about this weapon, though these would be the approximate stats if the weapon was ported directly from Team Fortress Classic. In case you're not currently looking at the screen, I'll read them out for you. Can be charged up to five times rather than just three. So basically what this means is, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. So a headshot would be 150 damage. Instead of going up to 450, it would be able to go up to 750. A 200% clip size. Well, it doesn't really have a magazine or a clip. I guess I guess you can call it a clip reserve. It's kind of weird how it works. But um, in Team Fortress Classic, it held 75. 150% damage on body shots, going from 50 to 75 damage. Shooting enemies' legs would temporarily slow them down. Yeah, that was a mechanic. Now, this one's not really an upside or a downside, really up to preference. You must hold down the fire key to charge the shot. And the only negative that could be listed is the fact that it can't be fired while airborne. And I guess you could also add no random critical hits, but that was just because of the game it was in. I don't, that's not really because of the weapon. The Cleaner's Carbine added June 27th, 2012. The Carbine isn't necessarily a terrible weapon, but when you have a secondary such as Jurati and the Cozy Camper, and then the pre-patch Darwin's Nature Shield as well, there's very little reason to use it. In addition, it's an SMG, which is already a subpar weapon. It can be great for MVM tank shredding alongside the Bushwhacker, but overall, it's a mediocre choice at best. High D tier. Trivia. On release, the clear carbine did not have the Kroiki meter, instead granting you the effect on a successful kill. However, when it was released, it would give you three seconds of full crits. This was changed to being eight seconds of mini crits. In addition, it also fired 35% slower, 25% we have now, so it was even harder to get kills with. The Alibaba Wee Booties, added June 23rd, 2011. A must have for Demo Knight. In fact, it's the only way you can play two Demo Knight. However, if you don't want to play Demo Knight, but you also can't aim your grenade launcher, you can use this item to become a 200 health sticky spamming Demo Man. Extremely good and a very versatile weapon. It's a very, very high A tier. Trivia. Once upon a time, the Alibaba Wee Booties was even better for sticking spam demo men. On release, it actually lacked the 10% movement speed bonus and only granted you 100% turn control rather than 200. Though in the gunmetal update, oh, the glorious gunmetal update, the movement speed bonus was added as well as a 25% charge on kill mechanic. It didn't last long though. The 10% movement speed on wearer was changed to only be in effect if you had one of the three shields equipped. The Cloak and Dagger, May 21st, 2009. It's a great invis watch for spy players like myself who aren't very good at traversing the map without being invisible. And it's really good if you're willing to play extremely slow so you can just hide in a quarter and wait for somebody to come by you. Though it's not very good for spies who are, you know, actually good at the game, but it is a pretty good option for new players. B tier. Trivia. 
There is very little to say about this weapon. The only unique thing is the fact that when this weapon came out, you could not pick up ammo packs to replenish cloak at all, instead of having to wait for it to charge back up on its own. This was changed to not only being able to pick up ammo while invisible, and you only receive 65% of what the normal invis watch receives. The Amputator. Ugh, poor medic. Added December 17th, 2010. Why use this when you have the Uber Salt? It's not terrible, but the taunt effect is niche, and the plus 3 health while active bonus is not worth giving up the 25% Uber on swing. C tier. Trivia. When this weapon released, it had no downside, similar to the Salon Bao when it released, and the current third degree. Oh, the conch. Oh, the conch. Added March 10th, 2011. Arguably, I, I wouldn't even say arguably, it is the best banner in the family. For most situations. With the passive plus 4 HP per second, only needing 480 damage to charge and having a great effect on top of this, it's a great team player, but also a selfish item. However you want to use it, it's just great all around. And it is our very first S tier weapon. I believe in the original video, I put it in A tier, but when I really think about it, yeah, this is this is an S tier weapon and it deserves to be there. Maybe on the lower end of S tier, but still a great weapon. Trivia, this one's a long one. As I said in the analysis, this is arguably the best banner out of three. However, on release, if I was to have the sentiment, people would call me crazy. On release, this was arguably the worst banner of the three. And let me tell you why. So let's take a trip back to memory lane back in 2011. On release, it used to fill up by taking and dealing damage, but it didn't have the 25% fill rate it does now, which meant it took forever to charge and you were rarely ever going to get more than one use out of it per life. It lacked the up to plus four health per second stat, which was added around the tough break or gunmetal update, I'll post that, what it was, I don't remember off the top of my head, and it originally was a plus 2 health per second, but it was changed to being scaling from 1 to 4, but it lacked it all together on release, it lacked the speed boost bonus that you got while the banner was active, which is one of the defining factors of it, and on top of that, we know the main effect of the banner is the fact that it returns 35% of the damage you've done as health back. However, when it released, it was only 20%. You may be able to see why it wasn't as loved as it is now. The Conniver's Kunai added March 10th, 2011. You either love this weapon or you just can't get it to work. If you're a good spy player, unlike me, you'll probably run this knife 9 out of 10 times. The overheal gain on backstab is phenomenal. This health return on kill can actually allow the spy to escape with some health left after performing a stab. If you're bad, it's just a knife with a 55 health penalty. If you're good, the possibilities are endless. A tier. Trivia. Once again, there's very little on this weapon. Though, just so there's something, it originally had a 65 health penalty rather than 55, giving this spy a total of 60 health rather than the current 70. It also allowed for up to 195 overheal rather than the 205 that we have now which technically means that you couldn't survive a melee critical hit, which now you can. Oh boy, the Cow Mangler 5000, released July 20th, 2011. The Cow Mangler is an odd case. The alt fire is pretty useless in most situations, unless firing into a sentry nest, which disables buildings. Though it will not do really any damage. It has infinite ammo, which is neat. This weapon is pretty good, but it offers very little difference from stock. Still. Beater. Trivia. Okay, now there is a lot for this one. So, strap in. First piece of trivia. Many OG TF2 players probably remember hearing about this one. You probably all heard it if you've been in the TF2 sphere for any amount of time. There was a short time frame after a 2011 update where the Cow Mangler could be painted team colors. This was patched within minutes, but a few were crafted. It changed the color of the projectile and the skin of the weapon itself. Though, after the Cow Mangler got a new projectile, the paint no longer affected the projectile. Though, the base weapon still had its paint. These are extremely rare. Extremely rare, as it's believed that about 7 or 8 were crafted. I believe that's the number that's off the top of my head. Um, piece of trivia number 2. This was the only weapon 
in TF2 history, as far as I know, that had a 5% stat. At one point, this weapon had a 5% reload speed penalty. Every other weapon has a minimum of 15 or 10, excuse me, a minimum of 10%. Ranging from 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%, 33%, whatever, you, you understand. This weapon was the only weapon in TF2 history, to my knowledge, to ever have just a 5% penalty. And number three. When this weapon released, it actually held five plasma shots, rockets, whatever you want to call them, rather than four. This was changed in 2013 to hold four just like stock. The Crusader's Crossbow... December 17th, 2010. What is there to say? Everyone knows this is the best medic primary. There is nothing, no reason to use anything else. In terms of medic weapons, this is an S tier weapon. And in terms of overall, it's still an S tier weapon. Trivia. Well, when this weapon came out, it actually didn't have a unique projectile. Borrowing the Huntsman's Arrow. This is why the Crusader's Crossbow has the no headshot stat. Also used to have a flat 75 damage. And it didn't reload while stored. And it reloads slower. And the Criticola at an April 28th, 2010. This weapon uh, was uninteresting when it released. Then it became decent. Then it became busted. And then it got buffed while already being overpowered. No scout didn't run this. Then it got nerfed and nerfed again. In its current state, it's alright. It's a good option if you're doing a solo mission. It's a great pair with a shortstop. If this was pre-patch, it would have been triple S tier. But post-patch, it's all right. B tier. Trivia. Every, I think everybody knows this at this point, but maybe not. The critical was added in a random patch rather than being in an actual update. The Cozy Camper, added March 15th, 2012. A good option if you just don't want to use Jirani. There's not really much to say. C tier. Trivia. On release, the stats were a little bit different. It didn't offer you a passive health regen, only granting you flinch resistance while scope. The downside to this weapon, however, was a 60% reduction to movement speed while zoomed in. Though this was bugged, and the actual slowdown was 94%, which basically made you a sitting duck. This would eventually be reduced to 80%, not bugged this time, before being dropped altogether. The Delocos Bar. Added March 18th, 2010. I actually kind of like this weapon. I enjoy the effect. The extra health boost is appreciated. Plus, it puts you past at least two major thresholds of damage. You can now survive three direct pills and two quickscope headshots if you were consuming it at a full HP. With that being said, it is overshadowed by the second banana and sandwich. C tier. Trivia. First one. I feel like everybody knows this at this point, if you've been in the TF2 sphere, it's kind of common knowledge almost, but in case you don't, the locus spelled backward is chocolade, which roughly translates to chocolate in Russian. Number two, originally had to be replenished by picking up health packs, as it didn't actually have a recharge feature that it does now. This is how old lunchbox items used to work. And number three. After July of 2015, eating the bar at full health would take you to 400 HP overheal before decaying down to 350. This is no longer how it works, because of an exploit involving the Delocus bar and the gloves of running urgent labor of 2017, which allowed the heavy to gain massive amounts of health. If any of you were around in that time, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. There were people getting into the thousands and tens of thousands of health, if not higher. When the exploit was patched, the Locust Bar stopped giving overheal. The Degreaser, added September 30th, 2010. I personally have no use for this weapon, as I prefer to WM1, but it could be good if you could actually aim. B tier. Trivia. Before being changed in the tough break update, it was the only flamethrower to have the same air blast cost as stock. Though in this update it was changed to 25 rather than 20 which means every unlockable for Pyro, other than reskins, has a more expensive air blast or lacks it altogether. There's also a little bonus trivia that I didn't write down. It's the fact that at one time, the quicker switch to speed and switch away speed was universal, which meant it would help you switch between weapons faster, regardless of what weapon it was. So going from melee to secondary would also be quicker. 
The Dead Ringer, added May 21st, 2009. It was once one of the most overpowered items in Team Fortress 2, though over the years it has had many reworks and has been reworked a plethora of times. Buffs, nerfs, it's gone through it all. Though in its current state, it's still very good watch to run, and it can definitely get you out of some sticky situations. High B tier. Trivia. Not too much interesting on this weapon. However, this weapon on release had a damage resistance so high that it could actually allow you to survive a backstab. The detonator added June 23rd of 2011. I don't really use this weapon, very seldom at least. It's kind of stuck. The thermal thruster can allow for much further ground to be covered and the scorch shot is better at area denial. But even with this, it's still a good weapon. It can allow for some quick traversing if need be. So for that, I'm gonna put it in B tier. Trivia. Before release, the detonator was intended to allow you to jump much higher, similar to a rocket jump, but this was toned down before it was added to the game. One of the newest weapons added, added, what was it? Six years ago. Six years ago. One of the newest weapons added six years ago, on October 20th, 2017. When this weapon launched, it was low-key busted. Then it was patched within about a week, and finally when the normal novelty, excuse me, wore off, we could see how good this weapon truly was. It was a great weapon for burst damage, and it was pretty fun to use. But it definitely wasn't as good as we probably thought it would be after, you know, we started to see regular flamethrowers again. That being said, it is a B-tier weapon. Trivia. There's really not much about this weapon. As I said, it was released not that long ago, and it only had really one series of patches. The Dragon's Fury projectile was 25% bigger than it currently is. In addition, the damage bonus stat that you get upon successions of hits used to apply if you hit them at all. So as long as the hitbox touched them, you would get the increased damage. This was changed to require the center of the fireball to make contact instead. The Diamondback. No, not that Diamondback, this Diamondback. Added August 18th, 2011. If you know TF2, you know the absolute monstrosity this weapon is. Crits for just doing what spies do, it's kind of ridiculous. In addition, if disguised, no one can see that you're storing crits, meaning you could see a friendly medic one second and get double tap for 102 damage apiece in the blink of an eye. This weapon is absolutely busted, S tier. Trivia. Once upon a time, the Diamondback was mediocre at best. Actually, in some situations, it was trash. As you likely know, the Diamondback stores crits on backstab and sap buildings. However, until 2013, the Diamondback only granted you crits for sap buildings. This meant if there was no engineer on the other team, you just had a stock revolver that did less damage and couldn't random crit. The direct shit, I mean direct hit, added December 17th, 2009. The best melee weapon in the game, you've all heard that one. This weapon is great if you can actually aim. The damage potential is ridiculous and the possibilities are endless. I'm not the best soldier out there, but I can still get some utility out of this. Though it's not very good for rocket jumping, at least not training, chaining rocket jumps. With that being said, A tier. Trivia. There's really not much on this weapon. However, I caught this one straight from the wiki. Apparently, the rocket moves at 1,980 hammer units, which is approximately 84 miles per hour. <sighs> yeah, I could throw about that hard. If you didn't know guys i'm a baseball player <laughs> i'm lying by the way um i kind of suck moving on two mini crit stats now apply to grapple hooks or enemies self-inflicted by blast damage whereas it used to not according to the wiki the disciplinary action added june 23rd of 2011. it's a great utility for getting the front line a little bit quicker while the escape plan is a better option nine out of ten times the disciplinary action still has its place in soldier's kit b tier Trivia. Once again, kind of call a knowledge thing if you've been around for a while. The disciplinary action has a much larger range than any other melee in the game, 70% longer than stock. This is likely a small oversight. This is supposed to make it easier to hit your teammates in order to give them a speed boost, but it also applies to damaging enemies. The hitbox is so large, in fact, you can actually hit enemies standing directly behind you. Two. This one I actually didn't know and I had to do a little bit of digging for. The speed boost used to not apply to scouts, sort of. 
The speed boost that is given on hit used to cap at scout speed, meaning the scout would still see the effect, but would get no actual speed boost. This was fixed in June of 2012. The Enforcer added June 23rd, 2011. A fall from grace. At one time, this was one of the best spy weapons to use. Several nerfs later, this weapon is a complete joke. Well, it was. It was somewhat revived with a niche ability to pierce certain resistances, such as the Fist of Steel resistance and Spy's Passive Cloak resistance. But even with this, this weapon is still a D-tier weapon. Trivia. Like I stated before, this weapon used to be arguably the best revolver. The 20% damage while disguise stat used to be a flat 20% damage bonus. It also had the ability to randomly crit, meaning you could be fighting with a sniper or a scout with your revolver and accidentally one-tap them with a 144 damage shot. Soon after, this was changed to a 20% damage bonus while undisguised and the no random crit stat was added. It was still a really good weapon, even with these stats added. It was still a go-to. Then they killed it. By changing the 20% damage while undisguised to a 20% damage while disguised. Now you may see the problem with this. Well, as soon as you fire, you automatically lose your disguise. This was this meant that you could only use one shot with a 20% damage bonus. That's it. Now you just had a worse revolver. It was useless. They tried to butter us up a little bit with the damage piercing stat which was bugged all hell on launch. Not working for half the weapon, it still doesn't properly work today. But I've spent too long on this weapon, let's move on. Equalizer and Escape Plan, added December 17th, 2009. Okay, so I decided to lump these two weapons together due to their shared history. On release, the Equalizer was outright busted. It allowed you to move at Mach 10 when at low health and deal an insane amount of damage. In 2011, however, it would be split into two weapons, the escape plan and the equalizer. The equalizer would end up getting the short end of the stick, just generally not being that great of a weapon, as running at people with low HP is usually not the best idea. I guess it's kind of a Hail Mary weapon, but it's not that great. The escape plan, on the other hand, is still a phenomenal weapon, and pretty much is an instant pick for most soldiers due to their utility. So that's an A tier for the escape plan, and an F tier for the equalizer. Trivia slash history. There was a lot to cover for this weapon as it had a very rich history. So let's start. Firstly, when the Equalizer launched, as stated, it originally had the stats of both the Escape Plan and current Equalizer. However, it would be split into two weapons in 2011. Though interestingly, the original Equalizer model was what would become the Escape Plan. Basically, the escape plan got the original Equalizer's model, while the Equalizer received a new model, which is the gray one. Secondly, the Equalizer was, when it was still one weapon, it was capable of dealing up to 162 damage when at low HP, which meant that it was, well, capable of one-shotting medics. And thirdly, anyone who already owned an Equalizer would receive a free escape plan. And just for fun, here is the stats of the original escape plan that I got off the Wikipedia. I'll just give you a second to look at those. Yeah, crazy stuff. The Eviction Notice, added June 23rd, 2011. This weapon's really weird. A little brother to the group, but just not as good. It still has a niche, and it's kind of fun to use, but overall, it's not that great a weapon. Very, very low C tier. Maybe even D tier, but... For now, I'll just leave it in C tier. Trivia. When the weapon originally came out, it was not the little brother that grew, but it sucked. On screen are the stats of the eviction notice when it launched. Yeah, the weapon was pretty useless, arguably worse than it is now. It would eventually receive the three second speed boost on hit, and later the additional movement speed and damage vulnerability that would submit it as the Gru's little brother. The Islander, released December 17th, 2009. Little to say, it's a go-to for Demonite, and for good reason. It gives you a speed boost, charge damage boost, and health boost for a minimal 25 health penalty. And while that doesn't sound great, you gotta realize this is often paired with the Alibaba Wee Booties, which gives you a 25 health bonus anyway, bringing you up to the normal Demoman health. And even then, it only takes two kills to get above normal health. And you get additional speed, and charge damage if you have a shield. It's a great sword. 
high A tier. Trivia. When the Airlander came out, it originally didn't have the green eye glow effect, instead having more of a fire yellow color instead. The Family Business. Added in the same update, June 23rd, 2011. Great for Fat Scout, not really much to say. It's a shame that it's a heavy only weapon, as other classes, especially Engineer, could likely get far more use out of this than the Heavy Cam. With that being said, C tier. Trivia. When it came out, it lacked the plus 15% firing speed stat that it has now. So it was just plus two shells minus some damage weapon. It also used to have a plus 40% clip size bonus, but this would just be rounded down from 8.4 to eight. So it had no actual bearing on the weapon. It was simply a visual change. The Fano War added March 10th, 2011. A must have for man versus machine marking giant robots Though, in casual, it's pretty much useless and not really worth using unless you're just kind of messing around. It would be S-tier if this was an MVM ranking, but since we're ranking it based on casual, D-tier. Fun fact! The Fan of War at one point had 90% damage penalty and didn't have the crits when it would normally mini-crit stat, which meant that you would only do 4 damage on a regular attack and 6 on a mini-crit. This would eventually be reduced to a 75% damage reduction, and it used to only mark enemies for death for 10 seconds, whereas now it's 15. Fire Axe, October 10th, 2007. It sucks, F tier, got new swing animations. I'm not talking about this one. The Fist of Steel, added December 17th, 2010. A great utility item. The Fist of Steel is not just good for survivability when you're getting pepper from afar, but also good for helping you to build Uber due to the minus 40% health from healers and minus 40% max overheal stat. Which sounds bad, but because of how the medigun works, the fact that max overheal is never reached, and overheal is slow, the medigun will build uber very quickly. Similar to why people use the boss of Asher and escape plan to help build medics uber pre-game. B tier. Trophia. When the Fist of Steel was added to the game, it lacked a red skin. However, when one was added, it was very bright red, which would eventually be toned down. The Fist, added October 10th, 2007. The Fists are just a stock melee. Not bad, but there's much better options for Heavy. D tier. Trivia. In the early beta, Heavy had no gloves, though in later versions, blue and red gloves can be found. Now in game, it is black regardless of team. The Flare Gun, added June 19th, 2008. I used the flare gun as an example early in the video. My opinion hasn't changed in that short time frame. It's a great weapon, lots of potential for high DPS, but it gets outshined a little bit by the other two flare guns. With that being said, still a very high C tier weapon. Trivia. When the flare gun was added to the game, it used to do 20 damage rather than 30 on direct hits. Not accounting for afterburn, of course. It also lacked the bur crit versus burning enemy stat. And when that stat was finally added, it was actually mini crits versus burning enemies. And then it would be updated to mid to long range flares would crit, while up close flares would mini crit. Finally, it was changed to full crits in the Hatless update of 2011. The Flamethrower, added October 10th, 2007 with the release of the game. It's a great weapon. While being basic, it is a great overall flamethrower. It has the lowest cost for air blast, 20, which does separate it from the rest distinctly. Like I said, great weapon, B tier. Trivia. Besides air blast not being in the game on launch, the flamethrower also had extreme fall off. The flamethrower used to kind of suck at launch. The flamethrower would deal ramp up, but would fall off to just 25% damage, or 75% less damage than the base level at max range. In addition to that, when Air Blast was added, finally, it would cost 25 rather than 20 and was unable to extinguish teammates. The Flamethrower has had so many changes over the years, I couldn't list them all. These are just some of the more interesting ones. The Flying Guillotine added August 2nd, 2012. The Flying Guillotine is an interesting case. This weapon used to be one of the best combo weapons in the game when paired with the pre-patched Sandman. However, when the Sandman was changed, the Flying Guillotine lost its main combo function. It is still a good secondary and can be fun to run if you don't feel like using any support weapons. 
can be good for doing high bursts of damage to finish an enemy off when they're at low health, but overall, it's just kind of a whatever weapon now. C tier. Trivia. 1. The guillotine can be thrown through thin walls. 2. The combo I referred to earlier is in relation to the Sandman's old stun mechanic. The flying guillotine used to crit versus stun enemies. It also used to mini crit from afar, but now it simply just reduces your timer by 1.5 seconds, but the, res the distance required for what's considered far range has been reduced. Finally, 3. All weapons in the game are technically automatic, except for one. At one time, this wasn't 100% true, but we'll, we'll get to that later. If you hold down mouse 1, the weapon will continue to fire, not needing to actually release the trigger. The guillotine is no different. If you hold down the trigger and wait for the recharge, as soon as the cleaver has replenished, you'll immediately throw it with no animation. The Force of Nature, added February 24th, 2009 in the Scout Update. I like the Force of Nature. It has a high burst damage and knockback, which makes it very fun to use. Is it the best? No. Is it practical? Not really. The Soda Popper and the Stalk Scattergun are often better choices for dealing quick damage, but this weapon is still competitive if used correctly. B tier. Trivia. Fun fact. The range is required to knock someone back was brought inward, so that it acts more like air blasts, as well as the minimum damage required to knock somebody back being 30. 2. The sound of the force of nature used is actually a scrap double barrel shot the scattergun was intended to have at one point. 3. Knockback to enemies is now only dealt by the first shot, rather than both, as of 2009. Specifically August of 2009. And this one I'm not too sure about. This one I got from the wiki. Most of these I kind of did a little digging for, but I'm not completely sure about this one. If you're an OG, definitely leave it down in the comments. Let me know. Apparently in 2009, the force of nature's damage was increased by 10%. But I was unable to find any supporting information for this. Oh man, the Frontier Justice added July 8th, 2010. The Diamondback, but for Inji. One of the best Engineer primaries for most situations. Engineer has some great shotguns, but this one is truly a fantastic one. It pairs great with the Gunslinger, being able to rack up a few kills with the Mini Sentry, and then having some 180 damage buckshot ready to go for whoever comes in your path. It doesn't have to be used with the Mini Sentry at all, either. It can be just used with the normal Sentry as well. This weapon is truly an S-tier weapon. Trivia. This weapon has not gone through any actual stat changes, except for one, kind of. At one time, the Frontier Justice lacked a crit cap, meaning you could store as many crits as you got kills. This was capped at 35 the literal next day on July 9th, 2010. The Gas Passer. Added in the Jungle of Grotto update of October 20th, 2017. Like the Phantom War, absolutely insane in MVM. Any man versus machine player can attest to this. A casual though, it is borderline useless and only worth running if you're bored and you need something to spice things up. It is high S tier in MVM. Probably the best weapon in S tier, even if it's annoying. However, in casual, and since this is a casual ranking, it is an F tier weapon, bottom of the barrel. It's a very, very polar weapon. <laughs> Fun fact. First, if someone is covered in gasoline and decides to rocket slash sticky jump, they will be lit on fire despite the fact that jumpers do no damage. Two, this weapon cannot be paired with the Neon Annihilator despite the fact that gasoline soaks enemies. Enemies doused in gas do not count as wet. And three, in Man vs. Machine, the explosion on Ignite used to be ridiculous, as the explosion used to count towards the damage needed to refill the meter, which basically meant you had infinite gas cans. This was changed very quickly. The Gru, the gloves running urgently, added September 30th, 2010. Yeah, fine weapon. At one time, this weapon was a must-have, as there was very little reason not to run it. In Jungle Inferno though, they changed the stat from taking mini crits for 3 seconds after holstering to slowly draining your max health over time, 10 per second, down to 100 health. It's still a good melee, 
but it has much more of a risk factor than it did a little over six years ago. It used to be damn near S tier, but now it sits more comfortably around the B tier. Trivia. In early closed betas, apparently, the gloves are running urgently was planned to simply reduce Heavy's health by 100, down from 300 to 200. When it was added to the game, the stat was changed to a minus 6 health per second while equipped. This is a little bit different than how it works today. It actually took 6 health per second, not just reducing your max health, like it legitimately subtracted 6 health. It was possible to die from just having this weapon out because there was no minimum. The Grenade Launcher. It released with the game on October 10th, 2007. You can't go wrong, it's very simple, just time your pills and deal a buttload of damage. While the Iron Bomber and Log and Load have utility, and the loose cannon's kind of fun, this weapon is a staple of demo map. A tier. Oh boy, I've been looking forward to this one. Kind of the reason I even made the original trivia video. But, trivia. As we can see, the grenade launcher model has six cylinders. This is because in early beta, the grenade launcher held six, rather than four. This was changed before the game launched. Except not completely. Some may not know this, but on the PS3 version of TF2, the patch was never added. So if you play it on PlayStation 3, the grenade launcher still holds six shots. Two. In early playtesting, the pill was meant to detonate off the first bounce, even if it hit a wall. We can see this displayed in the Meet the Demo Man video. Three. The grenade launcher in 2007 used to have visible pills in the chamber. And finally, in 2007 as well, the grenade launcher used to hold 30 in reserve, but this was lowered to 16. The Gunslinger, added July 8th, 2010. Annoying to play against, but fun to use. A good way to play more fast-paced battles in G-Style. The health bonus is also a nice touch, A tier. Trivia. The Mini Century has gone through a plethora of changes. For example, it originally built much quicker, being around the speed it is now when you wrench boost it. However, it originally could not be wrench boosted. You also used to get metal from destroyed minis, as well as minis starting at full HP rather than half. The Mini Centuries have gone through so many changes, it's hard to list them all. Second, at one point, it was actually possible via an exploit to build a level 3 Mini Century. But this was not intended and it was patched pretty quickly. The Gunboats, added December 17th, 2009. The Gunboats are great if you don't want to have a deployable secondary and just want a passive bonus that can help you rocket jump more safely without using something like the Rocket Jumper or Liberty Launcher. B tier. Trivia. The Gunboats would have been given the Demo Man had he won the war update. And second, the Gunboats originally offered a 75% blast resistance rather than the 60. The Hitman's Heatmaker, added June 27, 2012. This sniper is awesome. It isn't just great casual, but also man versus machine due to the focus mechanic and the explosive headshots. Well, that's an upgrade, but still you get the idea. It makes it a lot easier to use. It's a low risk, but high reward sniper rifle. It is phenomenal. A tier. Trivia. The focus meter used to be activated automatically when full, but now can be activated at any time during the meter's charge via the reload key. The Half Zatoichi added March 10th, 2011. One of the weird Demo Soldier shared weapons, a great sword on Demo Man, specifically Demo Knight, as the gaining 50% health back is a great bonus. But for soldiers, it's just kind of okay. He already has a ton of melee weapons as is, so this one's just kind of a whatever melee weapon. Overall, with everything taken into account, B tier. Trivia. For those who didn't play at the time, you used to be unable to sheath the Hasetoichi until you got a kill with it. This was considered honor bound. This was changed to subtracting 50 health if you failed to get a kill, and only being unable to sheath the weapon if you were below 50 health. Two. The Hasetoichi could randomly crit at one point. It also gave back 100% health rather than just 50. And lastly, the weapon will instantly kill anyone who is also wielding the Hazard Oichi. I feel like this is common knowledge, but just in case you didn't know or you're new to the game, yeah, it actually does have that stat. The Holiday Punch, added December 15th, 2011. 
The Holiday Bunch is kind of a joke weapon, but even with that, it actually isn't that bad. You just rarely see anyone, you know, legitimately using it, usually just Hoobies throwing sandwiches, but it actually does have some utility. You can actually make Uber players go into a forced taunt, which is pretty neat. With that being said, B tier. Trivia. The Holiday Punch has an unused black Yushenka officer style that was supposed to ship with the weapon. Uh, hopefully I put a photo of that on screen. The home wrecker. Added March 18th, 2010. Be a Pyro. Ingies will love you. Not all that practical otherwise, but still it's a C tier weapon. Trivia. The home wrecker did not have the destroy sappers mechanic for a little under a month on release, only dealing double damage versus buildings. The Hot Hand, added October 20th, 2017. Um, you know, it, it's funny, it's cool, you can slap your enemies and stuff like that. It's pretty neat. F tier. Trivia. For a short time, the Hot Hand was renamed to the Slap Attack in the official patch notes before the weapon came to the game. This was reverted by the time the Jungle Inferno update actually came out. The Huntsman, added May 21st, 2009. Oh, the Luxman. A fun, more up in your face way of playing Sniper. Personally, it's good for people like me who don't take the game all that seriously, at least when playing. It's just fun to kind of spam down choke points and shoot across the map and hope you hit something. It's fun, but it's also competitive and can be, if used correctly, can be really, really good. B tier. Trivia. When the Huntsman released, for some reason, it was left-handed by default. This wasn't achieved by flip view models, this is just how it was for some reason. In addition to that, it was also planned to have 18 arrows. This is even stated on the update page itself. Though, the Huntsman we have in-game only holds 13. And a bonus fact, ignited Huntsman arrows do not extinguish underwater. The Invis Watch added October 10th, 2007 with the release of the game. I mean, what is there really to say? It's a nice item. The best all around spy watch, you can't really go wrong with it. B tier. Trivia. There was really nothing on the spy watch, but in the gunmetal update of 2015, all spy Invis Watches received 20% less damage from all damage sources and reduced debuff duration while cloaked. The Huo, the How, the the Huo Long Eater, however you pronounce it. I know that's wrong. I've looked up the actual pronunciation, and I'm not going to practice for hours just to say it right. So I'm going to call it the Huo Long Eater. The Huo Long Eater was added August 2nd, 2012. The, the heater, honestly, is just kind of taking up space. It's not bad in general, but compared to other miniguns, it sucks. The passive ammo consumption when spun up is not great, and the fact that the fire ring can be simply jumped over or tanked makes it pretty much useless. D tier. Trivia. There's actually a lot about the Huolong heater, but I'm not super qualified to talk about it, as I've never really looked into it all that much. There are some cool concept art pieces and early models of the Huolong heater. I believe it was actually supposed to shoot some sort of projectile in its early concept stages, if I remember that correctly. But just so I don't BS you, one piece of 100% true trivia is the fact that the Hulo Long Heater used to consume 6 rounds while spun up per second, before being lowered to 4 in the Meet Your Match update. The Iron Bomber added December 22nd, 2014. If you weren't using the Soccer Day Launcher, you're using this. The definition of a side grade. It could be easier to learn due to how the TF2 physics work and the fact that the Iron Bomber grenades do not roll. There's really not much to go over on this weapon, it's just an overall solid weapon. A tier. Trivia. Something most likely everyone knows at this point. For a long time, the Iron Bomber Grenade's hitbox didn't match their visual hitbox. So basically, the hitbox of the Iron Bomber was scaled up for some reason. It was a bit too big for its visual model. Some used to claim that this is why the Iron Bomber was basically a direct upgrade to stock. Other than that, the Iron Bomber hasn't had too much interesting happened to it. It's had a few stat changes, such as the fact that it originally had a 2 second fuse, whereas now it has a 1.4, but other than that, there's really nothing else to say about this weapon. The Jag, added December 17th, 2010. 
The Jag is a wrench that trades out some damage and repair speed for a quicker setup. It is also a good definition of a side grade. Some claim that this is better than stock, but that's really up to you. Personally, I find that the stock wrench is better to use, but you can easily make a good argument for why the Jag might be better. With that being said, B tier. Trivia. The Jag was a very simple weapon on its creation, offering a 30% construction speed for a little less damage. It would become the staple of NG wrenches when it received a faster swing speed, allowing it to remove sappers quickly and repair buildings extremely fast. It pretty much is unchanged since then, however it does now take 3 hits to remove a sapper rather than 2. This was made to just balance it out a little bit. The Killing Gloves of Boxing, added August 19th, 2008. The KGB is a fine weapon, the crits on kill are awesome, and it's capable of causing mayhem in medieval mug batches. But even with that, B tier. The KGB has gone through no balance changes in the 15 years it has been in the game, standing the test of time. Though, according to the wiki, there's an unused version of the KGB that would grant everyone around you 50 HP as well as increase their crit chance by 10% for the downside of taunting after every kill. However, I don't know how true this is, as I have never heard that before making this video. So, take that with a grain of salt. Jurati, added to the game May 21st, 2009 in the Sniper vs. Spy update. The Jurati is one of the most well-known sniper secondaries, even outside of TF2. Just the concept of throwing a mason jar full of urine at people is a bit out there. As a weapon though, it, it works, being a great support tool as well as being good for exposing spies. B tier. Trivia. There have been no major stat changes besides a 20% cooldown when you extinguish teammates. Though, just so there's something, Jurati is short for jar-based karate, and the reason why Sniper can piss so much is due to the Saxton Hale pills he took, which tripled the size of his kidneys. I'm pretty sure most of you have seen the comic already, but I will put it up on the screen for you guys. Give me a couple seconds to read that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Pretty funny. The Kukri, Sniper's base melee weapon, was added on October 10th, 2007, because it's a stock weapon. I got nothing really. It's a stock melee. It works, but it's basic. C tier. Trivia. There's pretty much nothing. But just so we have something, the Jurati Chop achievement that requires three enemies doused in Jurati to be slain with your Kukri is a bit bugged, and it can be cheesed. It isn't exactly clear how it's bugged and what like what causes the bug to happen, but it seems that if you get two kills normally with any weapon in your life and then get one kill with on a Jurati doused enemy, the achievement will still be granted to you anyway, but it's not 100% understood how this happens. The Knife, released with the game on October 10th, 2007. The Knife is a pick for most spies, new and old. The Knife is just a melee you cannot go wrong with. It's fun to use, and it doesn't have any crippling downsides, because it's stock. B tier. Trivia. If you have not seen the TF2 2007 vs. Now video, I highly recommend you go watch that after this video, uh, as that's where I actually got the first fact from. However, here are a few interesting facts for it. Before the massive overhaul of the TF2's lighting and shaders, which was around 2008, the knife appeared to be a bit longer and a bit larger in general. Not just the blade, but the base as well. As you can see in the photo I put on screen, the base of the knife is pictured below the bottom of the palm, whereas now it sits comfortably inside uh, the spy's hand. And secondly, not specific to the stock butterfly knife, but I thought I'd mention it here, in February of 2009, for about three to four months or so, the radius was reduced to 160 degrees for a backstab. This was changed quickly and reverted back to the previous 180 degrees, which it is now. The Crits Creek, added April 29th, 2008, in the Gold Rush update, aka the original Medic update. The Crits Creek is a solid option for Medic. While the Uber Charge will always be great, which is what the stock Medigun uses, the Crits Creek allows for the potential to absolutely decimate teams. In addition, it is a must have for MVM in most situations, so that's why I'm putting it in the A tier. Trivia You know I love to spoil you guys with facts, but the Crits Creek is a bit light. But just so we have some stuff, I'll give you a few little interesting facts about it. 
In May of 2009, a new taunt was added for the Crit Freak, instead of using the base Medigun taunt. And a cool little fact about this specific taunt is when performed, it will actually give you 11 health points back. And on release, the Crit Creed built Uber just 10% faster than stock. This would be increased to 25% shortly after. The Le Tranger, Le Tranger, added September 30th, 2010. The Le Tranger is a fine revolver. It has great utility. And because you're a spy and you're probably not using the revolver all that much and you have your knife out 90% of the time anyway, the damage penalty on this thing has very little effect. It is a very good revolver. B tier. Trivia. The main draw of the weapon is the plus 40% additional cloak duration when equipped. Though it didn't actually come out with a stat, only the secondary stat that everybody forgets about. Yeah. On release, the main draw of it was the plus 15% cloak back on hit. It was not all that good, or not picked often. But the 40% cloak duration breathed life back into this little guy. The Liberty Launcher, added June 23rd, 2011. The Liberty Launcher as a weapon isn't necessarily terrible. It can get the job done if need be, and the supporting stats are nice, but <sighs> the damage penalty? The damage penalty neuters this weapon. It just that... If it just disappeared, you know, it, it would probably be a pretty good weapon. But because of that, and especially compared to the other rocket launchers that Soldier has in his kit, this is a D to your weapon. Trivia. The Liberty Launcher didn't always have the damage penalty, or the reduced self-inflicted blast damage, and definitely not the cliff size penalty, actually the opposite. When this weapon first released, it was a simple plus stat minus stat weapon, sporting a 40% projectile speed for one less rocket in the chamber. Then the 25% clip size penalty was changed to a 25% damage penalty in 2013. That was it for a while. This weapon was even worse than it was now for a short time. In November of that year, it would receive the blast resistance that it has, and it wouldn't be until Gunmetal that it would finally get a clip size bonus, going from a, it's funny because it went from a clip size penalty to a clip size bonus. Kind of weird how that works. The Lock and Load added December 10th, 2010. This weapon's okay. It can make it easier to hit direct shots through the projectile speed bonus and the fact that it has no grenade tumble, which it didn't always have. It is also great for taking out buildings due to the 20% damage bonus against building stats. Overall, it's not that bad. B tier. Trivia. Okay, stick with me. This one is going to be a long one. The Lock and Load has a very long and rich history. When it came out, it was a little bit different than it is now. It still had the shatters when hitting the ground stat and the additional projectile speed it does now but it used to hold two pills rather than three, which is why it only has two chambers in the first place, sported a 10% damage bonus in general, and rather than a 25% smaller blast radius, it would deal 25% more self-inflicted blast damage, which meant it was more dangerous to use up close. It would be in the Hatless update of 2011 that the lock and load would cement itself as Demo Man's, well, light class deleter. Right? This weapon has a history. Long history. The reason this happened, the reason for this, was because the damage bonus was increased from 10% to 20%. Wait, you might be thinking, wouldn't that mean the pill would do 120 damage and not be able to kill light classes? This is where a little thing called random damage spread comes into play. Random damage spread was a mechanic in Team Fortress 2, and it still is, and it can be enabled on any server, but typically it's disabled by default, that would vary the amount of damage a weapon would do by 15%, either more or less than base damage. So, when it had a 10% damage bonus, it could deal between 94 and 127. While yes, it was capable of one-shotting light classes, the chances were much, much lower. With the 20% damage bonus, it would now deal between 102 and 138 damage, which gave it a much larger margin of error.
for the grenade to one tap. The reign of terror would end on December 22nd, 2014, aka the Smith Smith 2014 update, where the lock and load now capped at 124 damage, so it could not one tap full health like classes anymore. Uh, well, it didn't completely end the reign of terror. This update also removed the, the visual grenade tumble, making it as straight as an arrow, and increased the clip size from 2 to 3. It removed the self damage penalty, replacing it with the 25% blast radius penalty, which hardly mattered. This weapon isn't really for crowds anyway. But the reign of terror would truly end in the gunmetal update when the 20% damage bonus was changed to a 20% damage bonus against buildings. But it can still two shot level 3 sentries, which is nice. The Loose Cannon, at December 20th, 2012. The Loose Cannon is a meme weapon. It can be useful for extending trims and sticky jumps, though as a primary it is far less practical. The Double Dunk is awesome, and like I stated, the weapon is fun to use, though it is not nearly as reliable as other grenade launchers. C tier. Trivia. Another weapon with very rich history, back to back with the Lock and Load. Here we go. The Loose Cannon didn't actually release with the Double Dunk feature at least not legitimately, having it being added eight months later. Now, the Double Dong technically did exist, sort of, but it didn't give mini crits and it had no sound effect or particle effect. In addition, the charge used to be twice as long, being able to charge for up to two seconds rather than just one. This was actually worse, though, because you would want it to be quicker. You would have to charge it for nearly two seconds for it to explode near you or just to perform a regular loose cannon jump. The loose cannon also had a stat where it would do half da damage if the cannonball hit the ground before exploding, meaning direct hits and what would become the double donks were important to make this weapon work. Though it wasn't all bad. The projectile speed used to be 50% faster rather than 20%. This doesn't actually mean the cannonball went further, but it technically travels faster in the stock, but due to how TF2's mass and air resistance work, it can go a little further than it does now. That's something you probably want to look up in another video. It's, it's too complex to explain here. It used to knock back enemies ridiculously far, whereas now it's more akin to air blast, and it did 60 damage on direct hit rather than 50. But over time, these features would be taken away and new ones would be added until the tough break update where we got what we have now. So it is a little bit better than it was on release, technically. But, uh, you know, it's, it's whatever. Having this next to the lock and load, oh man, this was difficult. Two very long segments back to back. Let's do a short one. The Machina, added August 18, 2011. The king of buddy shot sniper rifles. Pretty easy to use with minimal downsides. While the stock is a bit more reliable at being all around good, the Machina is still a phenomenal weapon. B tier. Trivia. Currently, the max damage for the Machina is 173. When damage spread was a thing, however, as you know, it had a 15% damage variance. This made it possible to roll a high enough number to instantly delete Devilman not running the booties and without the Eyelander, as well as Pyros. Okay. Mad Milk, added September 30th, 2010. The Mad Milk is one of those weapons that isn't just good in NBM, but in actual combat too. The Mad Milk is a great team support item, but can also be useful when you're just roaming around on your own, extinguishing yourself or teammates. A tier. Fun fact, the Mad Milk was released as part of the special delivery set, alongside the Shortstop, Holy Mackerel, and Milkman Cosmetic. Running all these back in the day would grant the Scout plus 25 HP, bringing the Scout's base health up to 150. The weapon combo was also really good, which was a nice bonus. Now, if you run this set, it just leaves a calling card. In addition, the Mad Milk used to return 75% damage done as health, whereas now it's 60%, so it was even better then. The Man Melter, at a December 15th, 2011. The Man Melter is a cool looking item. Being able to store crits by holding alt fire on burning teammates, Though, when there isn't another Pyro or Cow Mangler Soldier on the other team, this weapon just becomes a worse player gun with infinite ammo. 
The projectile speed is a nice bonus, but due to the lack of crit slash mini crit versus burning enemy stat, this weapon is crippled. At least it doesn't have the 20% firing speed penalty anymore, which is nice, but still, D tier. Trivia. This is one I actually didn't know until I looked it up. The official name of the Man Melter is the Man Melter 3600ZX. The Man Treads, added June 23rd, 2011. The Man Treads used to be a pretty useless item that only trollers would run for the memes. However, in the Jungle Inferno update, the 75% knockback resistance was applied to air blasts as well, and the 200% turn control stat was added. This didn't fix the boots, but it did make it a more solid option if your goal is mobility, and it can be run as less of a meme weapon. And if you still wanted to run it as a meme weapon, it was still really good, it made it even better. C tier. Trivia. As many of you likely know, the man treads deal three times whatever fall damage you would have taken if you land on an enemy's head. What's really cool about this is if you stack players on top of each other, and they also have the man treads, the number will be amplified. With a server of stacked soldiers equipped with the mantrads alternating red and blue, the weapon is capable of doing well over a quadrillion damage, which is kind of fun. The Market Gardener, added June 23rd, 2011. Funny Meme Shovel. It actually does have some utility if you can land your hits, but it's a funny meme shovel. B tier. Trivia. Like the Blitzauger, the Market Gardener's only downside on release was the fact that it couldn't random crit. They added the 20% slower swing speed for likely the same reason they added one to the Solemn Vow, just to say hey there's a downside without really adding a downside. Though I guess the swing speed does have more of an effect on the Market Gardener since you actually have to, have to use the weapon for its effect. Either way, moving on. The Medigun. It came with the game on October 10th, 2007. The Medigun is a safe option, great for major pushes, as well as being solid in every other regard. A tier. Trivia. The Medigun actually has received a lot of little changes. For example, as you know, if you switch between teammates very quickly with an Uber charge, your Uber will drain very quickly. This was not originally a mechanic. Having multiple healing targets didn't drain Uber any faster than just having one. This was changed in April 2008, so now if you're switching between targets while your Uber is active, it will drain much quicker. For a short while, there was also an exploit in TF2 that would allow you to hold your Uber by holstering the medigun, then bringing it back out when you needed invulnerability. This was changed in December of 2007. Very short-lived. Also, for a silly little fact, the medigun used to be able to heal spies even when undisguised, which is kind of funny. There's a bunch of little other facts, such as the three times build uber speed during setup, but I want to keep this segment moderate, so let's move on. The minigun, also released with the game on October 10th, 2007. What is there to say? The minigun is an all-around phenomenal choice. High DPS, no major downsides, very simple, very effective. A tier. Trivia. Another weapon with a surprising amount of history. The minigun, like the flamethrower, was a little bit worse than it is currently on launch. Though, it's a little bit better than the flamethrower was on launch. It used to spin up 25% slower than it does now, being more similar to the Natasha's current spin up time, which is 30%. It used to move slower when spun up. You moved at 80 hammer units rather than 110. And some of you may not know this, but engineers' buildings have a resistance to minigun fire. It was previously 20% for level 2s, and 33% for level 3s. Though in the gunmetal update, the level 2 resistance was lowered to 15%, and the level 3's resistance was, was lowered all the way down to 20%. The only thing the minigun had on launch that made it better, is the fact it didn't have the spin up and damage ramp up it had for the first second after spun up that it does now. The Natasha added August 19, 2008. The Natasha, a weapon that all new players seem to gravitate towards and veterans hate. The weapon is good, no getting around that, it's just super annoying to play against. One good thing is that at least it scales now, with the old Natasha you could be halfway across the map, have your pinky toe hit with a bullet and be slowed down to a crawl. Had no fall off like it does now. Either way, this weapon is a B tier weapon. Trivia. 
a decent amount for this one. Early versions of the Natasha were planned and had a similar effect to the Blitzauger. It was originally called the Ludmilla, by the way, giving the health back on hit rather than slowing people down. I honestly kind of prefer that. It'd be a little bit less annoying, though it could be kind of hard to balance. Two, the Natasha only had two stats on release, slow down on hit and a damage penalty, which was a bit bugged and sometimes would not be quite 25%. The 30% spin-up penalty was added around the time the base minigun received an increased spin-up speed. And lastly, another stat fact about the Natasha is that for a short while, the Natasha would hold 300 rounds and had a 50% clip size bonus. This was secretly removed in the gunmetal update. The Neon Annihilator added August 2nd, 2012. Funny meme weapon, otherwise it's pretty much useless with no complement weapon, D tier. Trivia, the Neon Annihilator has some weird stat history. Like the Homewrecker, it didn't release with the ability to damage sappers. And in the Triads pack that the Neon Annihilator released with, the page claims that it has a 20% swing speed penalty. Though when it was added to the game, it instead had a 20% damage penalty, which was then changed to a 20% damage penalty against players. Also, apparently it was meant to break like the bottle. At least it does now. Weird. Ooh, the original. Added August 3rd, 2011. Makes pogo jumping easier. The left hand bug is a bit weird, but it's cool. For real though, the original is a good weapon. It's just like the stock rocket launcher, but the rockets fire from the middle rather than the left or right. And it does make it better for some things. Like I said, pogo jumping. A technique where you fire rockets at the ground, bouncing up, down like on a pogo stick, kinda, kinda like that. You can gain some immense speed with this and you'll see a lot of pro rocket jumpers using this item. A tier. Trivia. Not much. The original was based off the Quake 1996 rocket launcher, but I think that's kinda, kinda known. The original was also meant to have a unique reload sound effect, but used the stock sound effect by mistake for a very long time. This wasn't fixed until recently. Oh boy, the overdose. Added June 23rd, 2011. God, on a June 23rd, 2011. The overdose is overshadowed by the crossbow, just like every other syringe gun. Though it's not bad, the movement speed is nice, it has some utility, but overall, it's a C tier weapon. Trivia The beta version of the overdose worked very differently than the current one. The plan for the overdose, and I'll put it on screen here, was that it would deal 90% less damage and fire at half speed, but would coat anyone hit with a syringe in Mad Milk. Uh, the, the Pain Train? What is this added to the game? Let's see. March 18, 2010. Huh. Joking, of course, but yeah, the, the Pain Train. Anyone legitimately use this weapon? This weapon is irrelevant, and it's a straight downgrade on any map without a capture point or payload. It, it's stupid, D tier. Trivia, well known at this point, but the pain train was originally intended for Pyro rather than the soldier and demo map. The panic attack added December 22nd, 2014. The current panic attack is not that bad, but it's often overshadowed by the class's other shotgun options. Pyro has the flare guns, soldier has the banners and boots, heavy has the lunchbox items, and NG, while it's a bit more practical, has the frontier justice and rescue ranger. This weapon is often just left in a person's backpack to collect dust. C tier. Trivia. Alright, history time, because there's really no interesting tidbits about it, so basically I'm just going to share the weapon's history. The original attributes of the panic attack were much different and kind of weird. It originally worked like a budget's beggar's bazooka, where you would start at zero, load up all the shots, and then release them in rapid succession. This weapon was not very good. They would eventually fluff up the numbers a little bit, like the reload and switch speed, and add the ability to store shells rather than automatically firing once you reach four. Oh yeah, by the way, it originally had a secret clip size penalty. This did not fix it. It would need a complete rework, and it got one in the Jungle Inferno update. Working like it does now, firing in a fixed pattern with five extra pellets, and having a spread that increases for each successive shot until you stop firing or until you reload. Though, when it was initially changed, the weapon was still not that good. 
the spread would get ridiculous and the damage penalty hurt. It originally was 30%. Finally, in the blue moon, the max spread was reduced by 40% and the damage penalty was lowered to 20%, making it easier to use and actually being able to take advantage of the extra pellets. The flood just the jigger. Jigger. The phlogistonator, the phlogistonator, the phlogistonator, the phlogistonator, the phlogistonator, the phlogistonator. That is December 15, 2011. Um, it's, it's something. It, yeah, it's definitely something to say the least. Uh, yeah, it only, it only, you know, encourages one of the uh, most simple and dumbed down and annoying ways to play Pyro, but whatever, you know, it's, it's cool. Beats here. Trivia. The oomph meter used to only require 225 damage before activation and lasted 12 seconds rather than 10, though it lacked the invulnerability, instead giving some resistance and refilled all of your health. There are also some neat particle facts. Here's a picture of the early concept particle that the flog would have used. And another cool little fact, for some reason, if you have the spell spectral flame on the flog, rather than having a cool green particle effect in the flog style, it used the stock flamethrower particle with a little green overlay, which is really, really weird to see. The Prison Persuader, another June 23rd, 2011 weapon. The Uber update truly added a lot of weapons. The Prison Persuader is a fine sword. The charge back and hit is nice. And the ammo boxes being able to give you charge for your shield is great. It is most definitely not a hybrid weapon though, as it reduces the ammo when equipped. And it's pretty extreme, it's 80%. Though for Demo Knight, whom it was intended for, it's not that bad of a sword. B tier. Trivia. The Prison Persuader has always been a Demonite focus, but it worked a bit differently. It only had two stats when it released. A flat double recharge rate, 100%, for all shields, and it also returned health for picking up ammo packs, which was pretty neat. That was it, though. There were only two upsides, though the second one kind of worked like a downside, since you couldn't actually, you know, collect ammo, because the ammo would immediately turn into health. So you would have to go back to the resupply in order to get stickier grenade launcher ammo. The weapon was completely reworked into what we have now in 2015 during the Tough Break update. The pistol added October 10, 2007 with the release of the game. The pistol is just a nice, simple secondary. There are better options for both Scout and Engineer. Scout has things like the Mad Mill, Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol, and Winger. Engineer has the, the Wrangler. <sighs> Still not bad, just a whatever option, C tier. Trivia. Remember how on the flying guillotine trivia portion I talked about how every weapon was automatic except for one at one point? Yeah, it was this one. The pistol originally was not automatic. Holding down the pistol would fire really, really slowly. In order to get the max out of it, you would have to tap fire like a semi-automatic. This would be changed in 2009, so now it doesn't matter if you hold it down or you tap fire. Let's get through this one quickly. The Pompson 6000, added December 15, 2011. This weapon's buns, terrible projectile speed, minimal damage, the cloak and uber drain is insignificant, not good. D tier. Quick facts. The Pompson's projectile used to penetrate enemies. The damage used to scale from 42 to 62, now it's 32 to 72. This weapon has a secret 34% clip size penalty and about a 30% slower firing speed. It also had cool concept art for the projectile. And we're done. The Power Jack. Added September 30th, 2010. The Power Jack is most Pyro's go-to melee choice. The speed boost is just hard to ignore, as it allows you to traverse the map very quickly and effectively. A tier. Trivia. Like the Blitz Auger, the Power Jack was also released with the only downside being no random crits. However, the reason it was changed is a bit different than weapons like the Blitz Auger. The Power Jack was forced to change due to the Hatless update, one of the weird quirks about the Hatless update of 2011 was that every weapon in TF2 that had a no random crit stat was changed to a 25% damage penalty regardless of what it was. The problem with the Power Jack specifically 
was that it originally had a 25% damage bonus. So adding a 25% damage penalty to a weapon that had a damage bonus just makes no sense. So instead, they removed the no random crit stat, as usual, but as well as the 25% damage bonus, and replaced it with a 25% melee vulnerability. It would stay this way for a while, but it would be when the item set bonuses were removed from the game, and the passive movement speed bonus from the gas jockey, which included the power jack, uh, degreaser, and one of Pyro's cosmetics, was given to the power jack. It had a few tweaks from there, but in 2013, that's when we got the power jack that we know now. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol added June 27th, 2012. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol is most scouts go to secondary if they're not running the Mad Mel for team support or winger for utility. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol is the best for dealing with actual enemies. The fire speed bonus for dealing with mercs outside your scattergun range is nice, and the health on hit is just a cherry on top. A tier. Another history segment, so grab your popcorn, we're gonna have a chat. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol was once a great weapon. A, then it was a downright terrible one. Then it was less terrible, but still pretty bad. Then it was outright busted. And now it's just really good. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol has had a tough time finding its identity. On release, the upsides were 15 max health on wearer, bringing up scout space health from 125 to 140, as well as the wearer never taking fall damage. The fall damage stat was to help when using the baby phases blaster. You didn't lose boost when taking damage, but you would lose all your boosts when jumping. Not just double jumping, like just jumping in general. I didn't mention that in the BFB part, but I am here now. This was meant to make it so you didn't really have to jump in order to avoid fall damage. With the downsides of a 25% firing speed penalty, which is the opposite of what it is now, and a 50% fire vulnerability for some reason. The weapon would stay like this until Gunmetal. Gunmetal created a new rule where weapons must be visible at all times to grant a passive health bonus. So things like the Gunslinger and the original Darwin's Danger Shield got to keep their health bonuses. Since the Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol wasn't visible at all times, it lost its stat. In return, it received a plus three health on hit. In addition, all passive bonuses were also changed to only being while active. This was the dark ages for the Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol. Well, not completely. Five months later, the number would be bumped up from three to five. This didn't really fix the weapon though. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol was still pretty bad. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol was no longer. But then, a little mass maniac needed a revamp and this update fixed him. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol was revived and it was downright busted. They nearly wiped the board clean, increasing the HP on hit from five to seven adding a firing speed bonus, removing the fall damage stat, and also obviously the slower firing speed because they now have a, it now has a additional firing speed bonus, and changing the downsides to just being a clip reduction from, or a magazine reduction, excuse me, from 12 to nine. This weapon was stupid good, doing what the winger's original purpose was and giving you health back. Of course, the winger kind of got a new utility. We'll get to that later. This was short-lived. First, having the health scale on distance, rather than always giving you seven regardless of distance, until finally they capped the health at three. So now, with a full magazine, you can only get 27 health rather than 63 health. Still a phenomenal weapon, though. The Quick Fix added June 23rd, 2011, the poster child of the Uber update. The quick fix is my personal go-to medigun when my goal is healing. That's just because I have no idea how to use the vaccinator. The quick fix does its job well for the slight downside of half overheal, which is almost an upside. Since the teammates never reach max overheal, the uber rate never actually slows down. This is a great medigun, and they really all are. A tier. Trivia. As you likely know, one of the stats is that you mirror any sort of quick movement of your healing target, such as rocket jumping, sticky jumping, thermal thrusting, etc. However, newer players might be ignorant to this, but the ability to run at scout speed while healing a scout used to be achieved only with the quick fix. 
That was one of its upsides, though in the Meet Your Match update of 2016, this attribute was applied to all Mediguns across the board. Also, the Quick Fix was intended to have a 40% faster Uber charge rate, but got reduced to 25% on release. But you also couldn't overheal at all, so that's a cool little fact that I thought I'd add at the end. The Quickie Bomb Launcher, added December 22nd, 2014. Just makes sticky spamming easier. Fun. B tier. Trivia. The Quickie Bomb Launcher used to work a bit differently. It held six, but the sticky bombs would fizzle out after two seconds if you didn't detonate them. Yeah. This was actually intended for sticky spam, as the name would suggest. The duration was increased to four, before being entirely reworked into what we have now in the Meet Your Match update. A Razorback. And in May 21st, 2009. Hate this item. Such a stupid concept. D tier. Trivia. The Razorback originally had a 15% movement speed penalty when equipped. This was removed very soon after, and it remained this way for a long time, until the Jungle Inferno update when they added the recharge mechanic alongside a no overheal and wear mechanic. The Red Tape Recorder, added August 2nd, 2012. Spy is only other sapper option, and it kinda sucks. The sapper is pretty much better in every way. The most the sapper will do is annoy the engineer a little bit. D tier. Trivia. Common knowledge at this point, when the red tape recorder is slowed down significantly, a voice can be heard saying, <laughs> Kinda odd. 2. The red tape recorder used to break down buildings at 1.6 seconds, which meant as long as it was placed on a building, and a pyro with the homewrecker wasn't nearby, it was guaranteed to level down the building. This was changed 3 seconds the next day. The Rescue Ranger, at a December 20th, 2012. This is a must-have if you're an NBA player. In casual though, it's still a very good option. While it may not be as dominant as it once was, it is still a very good utility item for making sure your buildings stay up and running from a distance. Hi, B tier. Trivia. Here are some minor facts in somewhat rapid succession. One. According to the wiki, there's some unused lines of code that suggest that the Rescue Ranger may have been able to place buildings from afar and not just pick them up. 2. The bolt originally didn't cost any metal to heal your target, now it's a 4 to 1 ratio. 3. The bolt originally healed for 50, then it was up to 75, and then lowered down to 60 as it is currently. 4. Long range pickups used to cost 130 metal, which meant you couldn't do two pickups on one max metal reserve. 5. The bolt's base damage used to be 35, now 40. This amount of random crit did 105 damage, which is now 120. 6. The sine wave on the little scope attachment will peak higher the more metal you have in your reserve. So it turns out I forgot to record a video for this one earlier, so it's a little bit later than it should be, but I didn't forget about it. The Darwin's Danger Shield, added September 30th, 2010. The Darwin's Danger Shield used to be another sniper's worst nightmare. Now it's a pyro's slight annoyance. Darwin's Danger Shield in its current state is a head scratcher, and not all that useful. D tier. Trivia. The Darwin's Danger Shield in early concept art had a more scaly, realistic style to it rather than the slick green style it has now. 2. Many of you probably remember when this thing allowed you to survive a quick scope headshot. This wasn't always the case. It was released with just a flat 25 health bonus. That's it. Though it was part of an item set called the Croco Style set. If you had the Sydney Sleeper, Darwin's Danger Shield, Bushwhacker, and Old Snaggle Tooth Headgear, it would grant you immunity to headshots. Sort of. Any headshot that would normally have killed you will now leave you at 1 HP, unless of course you're at 1 HP. When item set bonuses were discontinued, the Darwin's Danger Shield received a 15% bullet resistance in order to emulate the old set bonus. This is how it worked for a while, until the Jungle Inferno update, when the weapon was completely reworked. The Reserve Shooter, out of June 23rd, 2011. The Reserve Shooter is a fine shotgun, though its utility is often overshadowed by... the regular shotgun? Literally any other secondary? The Reserve Shooter requires a fair amount of skill to use effectively, but gives very little in return. It could still be used as a regular shotgun, but you have the regular shotgun for that. What about the switch speed bonus? Well, you have the panic attack for that. This weapon is not bad by any means, 
but it's just overshadowed and there's very little reason to run it outside of a loadout shakeup. C tier. Quick facts. The reserve shooter was only equipable by soldiers for the first three months or so after the Uber update. It wasn't until October that the Pyro got the ability to equip it as well. Two. The weapon was already stupid on release. It mini-crit airborne enemies, which included jumping, and even swimming for a short while, but the swimming part was a bug. Then it had a clip size increase from 3 to 4, and the duration in which it could mini-crit from 3 to 5 seconds after deployment. It no longer has this deploy mechanic, but that's pretty, uh, that's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, if you just jumped, this thing could mini-crit. Stupid. 3. Tap break fixed the weapons, so it can only mini-crit enemies force in the air via explosion, grappling hook, air blast, etc. However, the Jungle Inferno update treated him nicely. The reserve shooter became unable to mini-crit enemies force in the air by air blast. So, it's kind of niche and unusable for Pyro now. The Revolver, added October 10th, 2007, with the release of the game. Like most stock weapons, the Revolver is just... good. I hate to use that word so much, but it truly does encompass the vast majority of TF2 weapons. The revolver does what it needs to do, deal some damage if the knife is no longer an option. 40 base damage with a ramp up up to 60. Not bad for its intended purpose. High C tier. Trivia. The revolver, and revolvers as a whole, used to have a different reload animation. Rather than slinging the weapon to the side, Spy would throw it up directly into his face, blocking vision. Two. The revolver's cylinder used to spin. 3. Early videos depict Spy with the revolver show more of a wood style the kind of finish to it, rather than the white ivory style hand grip the revolver has now. 4. The revolver used to have a slightly different kill icon. Very slight, but yeah, you can see it. 5. At one point before the game was released, the Spy had the ability to reload the revolver while cloaked. Not shoot, just reload. Oh boy, here's a fun one. The Righteous Bison. At July 20th of 2011. What what should I say? It looks cool. It's definitely a cool looking weapon. But dude, this thing has no utility and sucks pretty much in every single way. If you're using this, you're probably purposely handicapping yourself. Just for fun. Actually, there is one utility for this weapon. Where it's actually kind of good. MVM players likely already know this. Specifically on the wave... The two cities tour where the three tanks spawn i forget the name of it if you upgrade the righteous bison's clip size damage reload speed etc and throw on a crit canteen this thing is surprisingly good at shredding tanks through the large hitbox and the hitting targets multiple time mechanic which was claimed to be a bug at one point either way overall i think a lot of you will be able to agree with me in its current state this weapon is an f tier weapon trivia at one point, the Righteous Bison projectile was the slowest in the game, with the exception of some spells and monoculus when he's not angry. At one point, moving at just about 850 hammer units per second. For reference, a rocket moves at 1100 hammer units per second. The Righteous Bison now moves at 1200, but still, that's, that's so bad. The Jumpers. The Rocket Jumper and Sticky Jumper. With the Rocket Jumper being released September 30th, 2010, and the Sticky Jumper being added October 27th of 2010, during the Scream Fortress update. The Jumpers are not real weapons, they are intended for learning how to rocket and Sticky Jump. The Sticky Jumper definitely has some real game use, especially if you're a pill god and just want a way to get around without using one of the shields. Though the Rocket Jumper is only really useful for soldiers and the rare Shotgun plus Rocket Jumper soldier, they're not bad, but they're really hard to rank. Though if I had to rank them, which I have to, overall these are C-tier items. Though the Sticky Jumper technically does have a bit more utility than the Rocket Jumper overall. Trivia. There's quite a bit for these two. It's going to be another long segment. Shared facts. The Rocket Jumper and Sticky Jumper were kind of weird on release. Both the Rocket and Sticky Jumper looked identical to stock. Like literally, it was the Rocket Launcher and Sticky Bomb Launcher, but they couldn't do any damage. The Sticky Jumper even used the regular Sticky Bomb model. In addition, when the Sticky Bomb launcher was added, both the Sticky Jumper and the Rocket Jumper received a health penalty. The Rocket Jumper didn't release with one, but gained one when the Sticky Jumper was added. It was a 75 health penalty for the Sticky Jumper and a 100 health penalty for the Rocket Jumper, bringing down 
both the soldier and demo man's health to just 100. For some reason. The sticky jumper and rocket jumper would eventually have their health penalties changed to 100% bullet, fire, and explosive vulnerability. Which was actually worse for the demo man, as he now had effectively 88 health against really anything but like fall damage and melee hits. It's kind of weird. Eventually, they would be given new models. Not the ones we have now. These ones. In my personal opinion, the good ones. In fact, I even use a custom skin for the Rocket Jumper, but I can't find one for the uh, Sticky Jumper. The reason they got new models in the first place was so that Medic would stop Ubering players with the Jumper, and enemies could tell if a soldier or demo man were in fact using the Jumpers and not stock. This didn't 100% work. In 2016, during the Meet Your Match update, we would eventually be given the ugly models we have now. And another little fact I thought I would add on there, you used to actually be able to carry the intel with the Jumpers but this was changed in 2012, as I guess it made them, you know, too useful. The Sticky Jumper originally used the stock Sticky Bomb Grenade. It was changed to the current one in September of 2011. There's an interesting fact about that one as well, but I'm going to save that for a weapon coming up soon. If you've been in the TF2 sphere for a while, you probably already know what I'm referring to. Another fact... The Sticky Jumper actually didn't release with the Sticky Bomb cap it has now. You could place 8 Stickies and basically teleport across the map. This was changed in September 2013 when they added the max of 6 Sticky Bombs at once. Rocket Jumper Facts The Rocket Jumper was originally able to allow you to survive the Kamikaze Taunt when performed with either Pickaxe, the Equalizer, or the Escape Plan. And another fact, the Jumpers at one time could random crit which obviously didn't do anything, but it could. The Rocket Launcher, and on October 10th, 2007, with the release of the game. Come on. It's the Rocket Launcher. Doesn't need an introduction. It's the Rocket Launcher. It's one of the best weapons in TF2, period. You can rocket jump. You can deal boatloads of damage. You can get random crits. All the good stuff. But it's not downright OP. And that's just what makes it such a good weapon, is the fact that it's kind of all-around balanced. A little bit of risk, a little bit of reward, you can deal tons of damage, or you can deal no damage. It's just kind of a good weapon. The Rocket Launcher is the definition of a high-tier weapon, which is why it is going in the high A-tier. Trivia. Here's another laundry list of facts for you. 1. The beta version of the Rocket Launcher had a rocket sticking out of the front of it, more similar to an actual RPG. 2. Soldier himself, but it only applied to the rocket launcher because it was the only rocket launcher in the game at the time, had a 40% blast resistance to his own rockets. The removal of this had no effect on rocket jumping though. 3. The rocket launcher used to hold 36 rockets in reserve. Then it was lowered to 16 in 2008, before being raised up to 20 like it is now in early of 2009. 4. The blast radius of rockets used to be a bit smaller. It was 121 hammer units wide, and is now 146 hammer units wide. You may say, oh, the grenade, same as the grenade launcher, right? Well, no, the grenade launcher and sticky bomb launcher were 159 hammer units wide at the time. But in 2014, the grenade and sticky launcher would have their explosion radius reduced to match the rocket launchers. So now the rocket launcher, sticky bomb launchers, and grenade launchers, except obviously if they have a stat going against it, all have the same explosion radius. Hey guys, so that is the end of part one. It turns out my video editing software can only go up to two hours. So I'm going to have to split this into two parts. As you already know, I, I, I titled it, but at the time of recording, I just figured out that it can only go up to two hours. So this one is released on January 10th of 2024. And I'm going to be uploading part two, if it's not already uploaded, on January 13th. So the weekend. Uh, it will pretty much, it will just pick up exactly where I left off. Like I said, I originally planned for it to just be one long video, but my editing software doesn't allow for that. I appreciate you guys watching and I hope you come back to watch part two. And if it's already up, go watch part two right now. It will literally, right where I left off. Right where I left off. This wasn't planned, it's right where I left off. Thank you guys so much, 
and I'll see you in a little bit.